Five days ago, I had no idea how to even navigate the Godot user interface, and now I've made a game in it. But how did I get here? To answer that, we need to rewind to late 2024, when Unity dropped a bombshell on developers by announcing a ridiculous runtime fee. Every time someone downloaded your game, you owed Unity money. Not just when you made a sale, but also every time someone decided to download it too. Now, thankfully, the community backlash was quick and harsh, with many developers outright switching to Unreal or Godot. Even Brackies, THE Brackies, came back from YouTube retirement just to show people how to use Godot. But that was a year ago. Since then, I've made two big Unity games, Pythia, which is a roguelike inspired by Bellatro, and Don't Push, a surreal puzzle platformer in the vein of Portal and Mirror's Edge. So why try Godot now? Two reasons. First, I had a game idea that I felt was small enough for a game jam. Second, I found a game jam that looked like the perfect excuse. Oh, and this Microsoft Surface Go 2 that I put Fedora Linux on. I wanted to make the entire game on this as a personal challenge. And, well, Unity barely runs on it, so I needed something lightweight. Honestly, this tablet might be the real reason I switched. But whatever the reason, Godot it was. Now I just have to learn how to use it. So, where to begin? Well, I started where any sensible person would, YouTube. Given my 17 years in Unity, I figured that the smartest move was to search Unity to Godot. And yeah, plenty of videos have been made on the subject in the last year. From that research, I discovered that while there are plenty of differences between Unity and Godot, only two really matter, at least at first. The first one is that Godot is node-based. The easiest way I can explain this is by showing you how each engine handles the same task. Let's say that we want a 3D capsule with physics. In Unity, you'd open up the Game Object menu, go to 3D Object, and pick Capsule. Then you'd click Add Component, and add a rigid body. However, in Godot, you'd start by creating a 3D scene, then hit Ctrl plus A to open the Add Node menu, and add a Mesh Instance 3D. Set its mesh to capsule, then add a rigid body 3D and a collision shape 3D to that, and then finally set that to a capsule as well. Is it more steps? Yeah, it is. But the trade-off is visibility. I can see exactly what makes up this object by just looking at it in the scene tree. Honestly, I think I prefer Godot's approach, even if it's a little less obvious at first. The second major difference? Scripting. While Godot does support C Sharp, it's pretty clear that its own GD script is the preferred way to do things. Most tutorials use it, most documentation assumes it, and so I decided to roll with it too. Luckily, one language I've worked with happens to be very similar to GD Script, Python. That said, learning all the subtle differences and quirks of GD Script in just five days, uh, yeah, that was a bit too much. So I did what I could on my own, but I definitely leaned on ChatGPT to help translate my Unity knowledge into Godot logic. Now that the jam's over, I plan to take a proper dive into the language, but for a crash course, it got the job done. So yeah, those are the two big differences in my book. If you're coming from Unity and understand those two things, everything else starts falling into place. So with that, I began making my game. I've been on a bit of a roguelike kick as of late, so I quickly mocked up a game idea. Basically a reverse vampire survivors. You're not the hero mowing down waves of enemies, you're the AI trying to stop the heroes. The Game Jam's theme was Link. And I had this idea to link together multiple dungeon rooms that the heroes would pathfind through. I imagined something like the Slay of the Spire progression, but with procedurally generated dungeon rooms instead of a map. Then you would have a level up system and accrue points with which to spend on abilities that you randomly acquire. This three point plan seemed simple, but as it turned out would be a lot to pull off in just five days. I started by getting some basic tiles in and setting up dungeon generation. I found a simple subtraction based algorithm that worked surprisingly well for carving out rooms. Godot also has a really solid A star pathfinding implementation built right in, and I used it to generate paths from the entrance of each room to the exit. And since I wasn't planning to give the player any direct way to modify the terrain, I could safely store that path in an array for the heroes to follow. Next, in A sprite, I mocked up a basic skeleton unit you could summon, and a hero unit for them to fight. Skeletons spawn randomly around the edges of the room. 
while the hero always enters the room from the bottom door and works their way towards the top door. Once I gave the hero a basic simple attack animation and made the skeletons charge at them like monsters and vampire survivors, I had a pretty solid gameplay loop going on. And it was around this point that I realized I only had two days left. Yeah, it took me three days to get to this point because I had to learn so much in such a short period of time. And I still needed to implement player abilities, the Slay the Spire style room progression, and a proper lose condition. Thankfully, one ability, Summon Skeletons, was already done from testing, but originally I had planned for like five different heroes and nine different player abilities. There was no way that was going to happen now, so I had to scale it back a bit. I figured it was more important to have greater enemy variety, therefore I scrapped the experience bar at the bottom of the screen and reduced the number of player abilities down to just three. Instead, the player will now passively generate runes to spend on their three core abilities. As for the dungeon layout, I had built the entire system assuming a single linear path. Branching paths at this point would take days to implement, and I didn't have days. So, while I unfortunately ruined the jam theme tie-in, I had to simplify it. The heroes would advance through an ever-growing but linear dungeon, and if they reached you and landed three hits, you'd lose. So yeah. I accidentally made a tower defense game. Now I've got to gush about something for a second. This tablet? It actually turned out to be really useful, and it's all thanks to the pen. Turns out, the stylus works really well in a sprite. I don't have a ton of experience with art or sprite creation, but being able to sketch out lines and erase them naturally, just like drawing on paper, unlocked a lot for me. I'm genuinely proud at how your boss portrait came out, along with the custom health icon I made to match. And to the runes? I don't think they would look nearly as natural as they do if I were trying to draw them with my mouse. 10 out of 10, would recommend. Once I got the new art implemented, I had about 10 hours left to create all of the new hero units. At that point, the only one in the game was the fighter, who randomly stabs a sword around them. So I decided to add three more to round out the roster. First was the Cleric, who passively heals nearby heroes over time. Then the Warlock, who I shamelessly modeled after myself, who applies damage over time to your summons, making him the polar opposite of the Cleric. And finally, my favorite unit, the Barbarian. He wildly swings an axe around like a lunatic, and as a result, he hits harder than the fighter, but has lower health to balance it out. I mean, look at him, he's not even wearing armor. Next up were the two remaining player abilities. I started with Grasp Heart, because from an art perspective, it was the simplest. It selects a random hero in the room you're in and deals 10% of their health and damage every 10th of a second, until they die. I also went back and tweaked Summon Skeletons to scale better. Now, it summons more skeletons depending on how far you are into the run, so they don't fall off too quickly. And finally, I added Royal Exhum, which summons a giant skeleton that uses its own version of the Warlock's damage over time ability. And that's a wrap. I had about four hours left before the jam deadline, but after crunching hard the day before, I was exhausted. So I hit publish and went to bed. And, well, I actually don't get that much interest in most of my Game Jam games. Let's see what the general census was. Uh, the game's a bit on the easy side, which makes sense. I was working on core mechanics right up until the last minute and barely had any time to test or balance things properly. But the feedback on the art and sound, uh, it was incredible. People really seemed to love the vibe, and several people said that the concept felt unique and deserved to be flushed out more. The event host even played it on their phone, and I didn't even know the game worked on mobile. But sure enough, it does. <laughs> so yeah, I think the reception makes it pretty clear. I should keep working on Lair Keeper, but not in its current form. The jam version of the game is kind of a mess behind the scenes. Kind of comes with the territory with learning a new game engine and doing a game jam. So combining the two makes it extra messy, I guess. So I'm planning to start fresh. I'll keep the art from the jam release, but rebuild the game from the ground up for a clean slate. And honestly, I've got some big changes in mind. There were a few things in the jam version that didn't quite sit well with me. Stuff that would work for a short game jam, but would feel out of place in a full release. However, that's probably a topic for another time. Maybe the first episode of a devlog, perhaps? I guess you'll just have to subscribe and hit that bell notification icon to find out.